Good morning, church. I am so glad that you're here. And if you're visiting with us, you need to know that you are a welcome guest here at the Alliance Church of Christ. Today we are starting a new series. We're going to be kicking off with that here in a second. I am super excited about the series that we're diving into. Some of you guys are super excited about the series that we're diving into. Some of you are just despising the series that we're about to dive into. We'll address that here in a second. But before we do that, let's bow in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are just so thankful to be here today. God, we're thankful for your grace and your love and your mercy. And Father, it is our prayer that as we offer ourselves to you, that your spirit would convict us and reveal to us the ways that we have wronged others. Father, that your spirit would convict us of the sin in our life. And God, that we would find ourselves leaving this place looking more like your son. Uh, Father, we're thankful for the community. Uh, (laughs) We really make a big deal about trying to build community here. And so, Father, I pray next week that all of us commit to coming. And God, that, that we would possibly even use this opportunity to invite someone new to the community, just to check out. God, we pray for our homeless shelter. Uh, Father, for this this outreach, this opportunity to serve our community. Father, we pray that it's it's well received. And God, that we continue to build a relationship with those who are down there. Father, may we figure out new and creative ways, not only to serve them, but Father, to serve our neighbors, to serve this body. Father, that your name would be glorified in this place. Father, this morning, it's my prayer that you be merciful upon the speaker, for his sins are many. God, may he not get in the way of your perfect message. Father, anything that is of him, may it be blown away like the chaff. But the things that are of you, the things that are pure and lovely and true, God, may those things stick to the hearts of your children today. Father, may it prick the heart of those who might be visiting or the unbeliever or the skeptic today. And Father, may each of us take one step closer to you. God, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity to study this morning. God, we're thankful for our Bibles. It's in your son's precious and holy name we pray. And the whole church said, amen. So like I said just a moment ago, we're starting a new series. And if you can't tell from the slide behind me, the title of this series is Bad Blood. It's everywhere, y'all. Bad blood. Bad blood is everywhere. And so let me just try to break this down for you. What bad blood is, just to make sure we're all on the same page. What is bad blood? Bad blood is this, Zach, if you would bring up that definition for us. Bad blood is the unpleasant feeling towards or dislike between people. The unpleasant feelings towards or dislike between people. And just in this moment, some of you know that this series was tailor-made for you because you have some unpleasant feelings towards or dislike of some people. Now, here's the the crazy thing about this series. All of us have at least observed, at the very least, observed bad blood in the life of a relationship close to us. And some of us have had the unfortunate experience of having bad blood creep into a relationship Maybe it was a relationship between you and a best friend. Maybe it was a relationship between you and an ex-spouse. Maybe it was a relationship between you and a boss or a coworker. Maybe it was a relationship that wasn't really that close, but, but you were still friends, you were acquaintances, and now you're just distant. See, bad blood is this. Let me, let me try to flesh out some experiences. Bad blood is the tension that you feel. When you hear that one of your friends at school 
is gossiping about you. Bad blood is, is that uncomfortable feeling when someone betrays you and then offers you an apology, which would have been great, but their apology was more like a slap in the face than an invitation for reconciliation. Have you ever had one of those experiences? One of those moments where someone's like, oh, I didn't realize you were so sensitive. I'm sorry. And you're like, <laughs> jerk. <laughs> Bad blood is what's produced in a relationship because we are blind to see how our actions, our joking, our words hurt or offend someone else. See, bad blood is the dissonance. Listen to me. Bad blood is the dissonance that's produced in a relationship because of wrongdoing or relational ignorance. Let me say that again. Bad blood is the dissonance that's produced relationally because of wrongdoing or relational ignorance. And some of you know what bad blood feels like. Because bad blood is what you have experienced for a long time with that son or daughter of yours. Bad blood is what you've experienced for a long time with that coworker of yours. Bad blood is what you've experienced for a long time with that person that's sitting a couple rows back to your left. Bad blood is everywhere. And it has to be addressed. Now, we're all emotionally intelligent people here. I can tell just by looking at you. So what I'm about to say isn't going to be new to any of us. But what I want to do is I want to just give us some truths about bad blood. I want to take a moment as we kick off this series and just work some, through some truths about bad blood. And you'll recognize them as true. Or maybe, maybe this might be new for you. All right, so here's the first truth about bad blood. And it's this. Bad blood starts with a heart issue. Bad blood starts with a heart issue. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Again, over in Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 21, Jesus says this, and, and I just, I, I want to just read this. He says, for from within, out of the heart of man, come, listen to this, listen to this, evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. That's a list and a half, church. For from within, out of the heart of man, these things are produced. Every single case of bad blood that you've experienced, every single case of bad blood that I've experienced, every single case of bad blood in the entire world has started with a heart issue. It started because we lacked patience or gentleness. It started because we were foolish or arrogant. It started because we just found ourselves completely given over to pride. Bad blood starts with a heart issue. Second truth about bad blood. Zach, if you would go ahead and bring that on up. Bad blood can infect any relationship. This is the truth about bad blood. 
And we actually see this in Scripture. In Acts chapter 15, there's this scenario where Paul, the guy that everyone in the church tends to look up to, Paul, this guy that most of us idolize as a man who is just, like he is, a, like you have humanity and then you have Paul. Like, I mean, he's just, he's like a super Christian, all right? And so Paul is this super Christian. Well, Paul is associated with this man named Barnabas. And, and they're getting ready to go on their second missionary journey. And they have a disagreement. And if you've read your Bible, if you've spent some time in Acts, you remember what the disagreement's about. It's about whether they should take a young man named John Mark. And the text says that a sharp dispute was had between Paul and Barnabas. And they split ways. Bad blood can infect any relationship. And you know this. Actually, if, you, if you're not aware of this, it, it could ruin your marriage. It could be the pride that ends up ruining your marriage because you're just so unaware that bad blood can creep in to a marriage. It can creep in to that best friend relationship and it can infect it, which leads us to our third truth, and that is bad blood is toxic. Bad blood is toxic. It is poisonous. If you've ever had it in your life, people around you don't want to hang out with you because they look at you and you're just such a sour person. You're just so mean. You're just so rude. You're just so inconsiderate. You're just so arrogant. Bad blood is toxic. It will destroy your marriage. It will destroy friendships. It will destroy relationships. It will destroy you. And here's the thing. It leads us to our fourth truth about bad blood. Bad blood is highly contagious. Bad blood is highly contagious. Contagious. So just a second ago, we were referencing that guy named Paul. And Paul, a little later on, actually several years after he has this experience, he writes in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 14, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Now why would Paul have to write that? Because Paul knows a truth in the flesh that you and I both know. Now, what, what's about to come up, you might agree with. And so I'm going to give you permission to just give a nice hearty amen, all right? Nod your head, church. Okay, everybody's on the same page, all right. So Paul knows a truth that we know in the flesh, and it's this. Zach, bring that up. It's easier to curse the jerk than bless his mess. Amen? In the flesh, it's easier to curse the jerk than bless his mess. Man, when someone is mean to me, what do I want to do? I want to debase myself. And I want to fight fire with fire. I want to make sure that he feels my pain or she feels my pain. And so Paul says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse because it's easier in the flesh to curse the jerk and bless his mess. The last thing we want to do is see our enemy thrive. And so this is why Paul, in verse 21, a little bit later on in that passage, Zach, if you would, says this. Do not, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That word overcome it's Nikeo, it's where we get Nike from. Nikeo, victorious, victory. And so literally Paul says, don't let evil have victory over you. Here's what he's saying. The temptation is for you to debase yourself to fight fire with fire. And if you do that, evil has won in your life. Here's the way that you overcome evil. Overcome evil with good. Martin Luther King Jr. put it this way. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. But bad blood is highly contagious. And so when someone mistreats us, when someone persecutes us, 
Our temptation is to rear back and let them have it. So here's how I want to spend the rest of our time. I want us to look at one verse. One verse that I believe speaks volumes into this conversation. It's in Romans chapter 12. If you have your Bible, if you have your iPad, your iPhone, your smartphone, whatever you have, open it up to your Bible to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Now to give you a small little glimpse of context there, Romans is a book written to Jews and Greeks that are now in the same church and there's some dispute, there's some trouble brewing in the church. And in Romans chapter 12, Paul takes this shift from theology to practice. And starting in verse 14, he really starts to identify our life with outsiders, those enemies, those persecutors, those people that stand at odds with us. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, we find our verse. Here's what Paul says. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Now, Here's what I want to do. I just want to break down this verse. Take it chunk by chunk. And the first chunk I want to focus on is live peaceably with all. If Paul left this and didn't say anything else, we would say, Paul, you have to be kidding. Because how is this even possible? Live peaceably with all. Peace isn't something that you can just like have on a one-sided thing. Peace is something like it has to be mutual, right? It's, it's mutual. Hey, you know, I'm at peace with you. You're at peace with me. If someone's at war with you, can you really have peace? I mean, I, I just really don't understand this. And so I love what Paul says at the very beginning of this verse. He says, if possible, if possible, live peaceably with all. See, you know this. Peace might not be possible with some people. There are some people out there that they're just unappeasable. There are some people out there that they won't be at peace until you bend over backwards and do a backflip seven times. There are some people out there that it's just impossible to live at peace because they're just so angry, period. They lack peace and so no one else around them can have peace. Paul says, if possible, live peaceably with all. Now, here's what I want to address real quick because preaching is so difficult. (laughs) You have an audience of like 120 plus people and all kinds of different experiences. So let me try to speak into two different storylines here. First storyline I want to speak into are those of you who are in a relationship with someone that is unappeasable and they just, they won't give in. As the example of this is a young woman whose family said, we can be at peace as long as you give up Jesus. How does she live at peace with her family then? How does she live at peace with her family when it's that alternative? So here's what I want to say to you, and you can go ahead and write this down. You can have peace about the relationship, even without peace in the relationship. You can have peace about the relationship, even without peace in the relationship. You can look at a a scenario and you can say, you know what, and we're going to get to this in a second. I've done all that I can. I've given 100% of myself. And they're still not happy. They want me to give in my morals. They want me to change my ethics. And I just, I can't, I can't do that. And so you can have peace about the relationship. Even without peace in the relationship. You can stand confident. Now, here's the second part. Because some of you said, if possible, and I know exactly where you went. You're like, thank God someone has acknowledged it. I don't have to go after that person. Because I don't really want to make peace with that person. 
you know what? They're just so difficult and, it, and they're just so, I mean, they're just so messed up. They have so many problems. And man, I just, I, I get it. They're, I just, I don't want to deal with those people. And here's what I would say to you, Zach. The pursuit of peace, even without the promise of peace, is not a pointless pursuit. The pursuit of peace, even without the promise of peace, is not a pointless pursuit. Just because you're looking at odds at someone and someone you know is going to stand and say, I don't want to be at peace with you, I don't want to be at peace with you, I don't want to be at peace with you, does not give you the right to not pursue peace with them. The pursuit of peace, even without the promise of peace, is not a pointless pursuit. That is the thing that won the civil rights battle in the 60s. Even without the promise of peace, the pursuit of peace was not a pointless pursuit. I want to come back to our text again, Zach, if you will. If possible, as far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. Now I want to focus on that little section in the middle. As far as it depends on you. When we're at conflict, who do we spend most of our time thinking about? I spend my time thinking about the other person. They need to change this. They need to do that. They, man, you know what? If they wouldn't use that type of language, they wouldn't set me off. You know what they did? Can I tell you a little bit about their story? If they just weren't so messed up? Let me ask you this. What would happen if you just focused on you? What if you focused on you? What if we were asked the question, what depends on you? What depends on you? What did you bring to the table that added to the conflict? What did you bring to the table that added to the drama? What baggage do you bring into the relationship that added to the chaos? What depends on you? Now, if you're like me, here's the way I think about my part, my little slice of the pie, Zach. When I think about my part in a conflict, it looks a little like this. Because, like, I know, I'm, I'm broken. I've told you guys this. I'm a jacked up person. And so, like, I have, I have a piece of the pie. I recognize that. But psychologists will say, that our default option is always to put ourselves in the better light. And so maybe if, if we really ask the question, what depends on us, what depended on us, what depends on us, it looks a little bit more like this. Or maybe in your conflict, you can be honest and you say, man, I, I was most of the issue. It was my immaturity. It was my language. It was my attitude. It was my perspective. As far as it depends on you, what depends on you? What depends on you? If you were to take one step, could it make the difference? Maybe we should ask this question. Have you gone as far as you can go? Can you go any farther? Here's here's what the text says. If possible, as far as it depends on you, Live peaceably with all. Can you go any farther to make peace with the people, the family members, the co-workers, the bosses, the children, the aunts, the uncles, that random person at church that ticked you off 10 years ago? Can you go any farther? And you know, Scripture doesn't give us a lot of wiggle room in this. Because in Matthew 18... Jesus says, if your brother has offended you, if your brother has a sin against you, you should go and pursue him. And so if someone has sinned against you, it is your responsibility to take those steps. And then in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, hey, you know what? If your brother has anything against you, did you hear the shift? This isn't, hey, you know what, are you okay? Are you at peace? Are you comfortable? The question now becomes, you become aware that your brother has an issue with you. And who does he put the responsibility on then? You! 
but he's the one with the issues. He's the one that's lacking peace. Doesn't matter. If your brother has a problem against you, go and try to make peace with your brother. As far as it depends on you. Live peaceably with all. See, here's the truth, church. When we do all that we can to be at peace with another person, when we take every step possible trying to make wise decision after wise decision, it might not be possible. You might put yourself out there only for them to shut that door, only for them to slam that door in your face. But as far as it depends on you, Live peaceably with all. Now, some of you guys aren't believers here this morning, and so you're like, I don't want to do that. And that's okay. I get that. Because this is crazy. But if you're a believer, if you're a believer, we don't have as much wiggle room. See, the world would say that living at peace with people is, is, is wise. But I get it, it's difficult. Jesus says, this isn't an option. See, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, forgive one another as Christ Jesus has forgiven you. So let me ask you this as we wrap up. Aren't you glad God took the extra step to make peace with you? Aren't you glad that God didn't stick up his nose and say, you know what? I've sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. I have tried and tried and tried and tried, and I've sent sermon after sermon after sermon. There's been relationship after relationship after relationship. I'm done. I'm washing my hands of you. See, when we were enemies, when we were at odds with God, Christ Jesus came. God took a step towards you when you refused to take a step towards Him, knowing that it might be only for you to slam the door in His face. See, he knew that the pursuit of peace, even without the promise of peace, is not a pointless pursuit. And so, I get it. Those people are crazy. I get it. You're completely sane individuals dealing with a crazy, jacked-up world. I understand it. Your family's crazy. They're nuts. Certified boncos. But you're still called to fight for peace. Because it's by our love that the world will know who we belong to.